Hello, everybody. Welcome. Lovely to see such a full house tonight. Thank you all for coming out to this uh, lecture. My name is Jaap Janssen and I'm program maker at Studium Generale. And Studium Generale is a platform of the university that organizes lectures, debates, lecture series, film and talk evenings and cultural events on a variety of topics. And tonight we are going to talk about this book, Morality. And it's written by Hanno Sauer. And the first time I heard of Hanno Sauer was via Arnon Grunberg, who is a famous Dutch writer. And he reviewed this book in the Dutch national newspaper, the Volkskrant. And um, well, that made me curious. It was pretty positive, this review. So I decided to, to buy this book and um, after reading it I thought well more people should get to know this book because there are a lot of interesting and maybe even thought provoking ideas in it. It's very rich and it's, it's fascinating. And Hanno Sauer is a writer and a philosopher. He teaches um, ethics, <coughs> meta-ethics and um, political philosophy at Utrecht uh, University. And he is also doing a, re a European research project on moral progress. He heads this project and he has written a lot of articles, essays, books. Books like Moral Thinking Fast and Slow, Debunking Arguments in Ethics and this one Morality, morality, the invention in, of good and evil, and it's of course the Dutch translation. The lecture will take approximately 45 minutes to an hour, and after the lecture we have half an hour for Q&A. I wish you all a very learning and pleasant evening. Please give him a warm applause. The floor is yours, Hanno. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Thank you again for, for inviting me. I was very happy to accept. And uh, you've put together a really great program. And I think you should all also consider checking out the other lectures. There's so many and uh, the content is, uh, is exciting and, and very varied. And I think you can appreciate the rest of the program throughout the coming weeks and months. Thank you all for coming. I'm very pleased to see such a good turnout. Uh, I'm hoping that you'll be not too bored uh, and that you find it interesting. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it short. Gonna, I'm gonna aiming for um, 45 minutes. Uh, I hope I can, I can cover all the themes that I want to at least sketch or mention over the course of that, of that time span. And with that, we can start. I think when big moral shifts happen in society, almost everyone kind of feels them. Almost everyone gets that vibe and that atmosphere that something is moving and changing and shifting. And it, in my experience, at least, I mean, it may be the people that I hang out with, but uh, when you go to a, whatever dinner party or, um, or different social gathering, after a while, you know, during the later hours especially, you see that people are really fascinated by these types of topics. Where are we headed? How does society function? How should we think about social injustice, inequality, um, oppression, hierarchy? What's the relevance of identity and the groups that we identify with and that we belong to or that other people think we belong to for how we want to live together and how we sort out a thriving life in modern society. How should we deal with discrimination and vulnerable people, marginalization, disadvantage and advantage, privilege, and so on and so on and so on. And people, I think, are really interested in these types of topics and trying to understand how should we get along, how can we get along, how can we still get along, how should we treat each other, how should we speak to and with each other. And these are the types of topics that um, 
I'm also very passionate about and interested in. I really wanted to understand them. And I think one sort of tried and true approach to understanding precisely these types of questions is to try to investigate their history. And so this project of trying to understand the, the nature and basis of our morals, of our norms and values, by um, trying to investigate their historical origins is usually associated with Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, it's this project of um, trying to supply um, a so-called genealogy of morals. And the idea is that our moral values, they don't fall from the sky, right? They don't fall into our laps. They have a history, they have an origin, they have a narrative, they have a story. They are not given to us, handed down by some sort of divine revelation. They're not deduced a priori from pure reason, from pure principles and logical thinking, but they have a fragmented history. And we can do a kind of ar archaeology of that history. We can dig up the origins of our norms and values and see how they shift in response to historical changes in the economy, in technology, in society, in politics, and in nature. And that's the way to try to understand what morality is all about. Now, famously in Nietzsche, his idea was that we can undermine many of our norms and values, right? Nietzsche's idea was, I can tell you a story about where your values come from. I can tell you a story about why you embrace equality and compassion and humility. And that story, you're not gonna like it, right? I can tell you a story about where those values come from. And once you've heard it, you're gonna have some extra distance towards those values, right? You're gonna to start to question them because it's an ugly history. It's not a nice history of love and insight into objective moral truth, but it's a history of people with sinister intentions trying to force you to accept something that isn't good for you. And this project is one that I think was valuable at the time and I st still do think that this genealogy of morals is in many ways the way to go when we want to understand morality and ethics and norms and values. But I think we can, st we can tell that story differently. We can tell that story in a way that doesn't undermine all of our moral values, but it gives you the tools to understand which of these values do make sense, which of these values make less sense than you thought, which of these values make more sense than you are now inclined to think, and which of these values perhaps should be abandoned altogether. But it's a mixed story that not just undermines some of our norms and values, but it also vindicates some of them. It justifies some of our norms and values, and it shows why they are the way they are, why it makes sense that they are the way they are, and why we um, have good reason to accept some of these norms and values and institutions and rules and rituals because they help us work together and live together in a way that benefits everyone at least to some extent. And so the way that I tried to try to organize this narrative was I tried to think about what, what, what do I think are <clears throat> the main moral transformations that humanity has undergone over, over its history or even prehistory. And I came up with this structure of uh, trying to tell this story of the origins and development of our moral norms and values in seven chapters, starting five million years ago, then 500,000, 50,000, 5,000, 550, and five. And with five years, we are in the present. And I try to offer a kind of diagnosis of present day society that, that shows how all of these elements that emerged over the other moral transformations are combined in new and fresh ways to explain the characteristics of the current moral zeitgeist, so to speak. All that stuff that we all talk about, what can we still say, can I wear a Chinese costume for carnival, and that sort of stuff, right? Uh, that's th that kind of diagnosis is supposed to, to be the, the end result um, to some extent. Um, and the, 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 the themes, that, these, are, these aren't by, 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 by any means the only themes, but the main focus points of these chapters are cooperation, punishment, culture, 
hierarchy inequality, individualism, inclusion, and then identity. And I can't spell out all these arguments that I present in the book today, of course, and, I, and, and you don't want me to, um, but I'll try to at least give you an idea of what happens in the book. Hopefully, again, it won't take too long. And then I'm very curious to hear what your questions are and what you would like to talk about, and maybe we have time for at least a couple of minutes of conversation after the talk. Nietzsche also said, and I think he was right about that, is that which has a history cannot be defined. So because it's not neat, you know, it wasn't designed by anyone with a purpose in mind, it just came about in different ways. And it's this Frankenstein's monster of the different pieces stitched together. That's why I don't want to offer a definition of what morality is. The working concept of morality that I, that I employ in, in the book and today is that morality is sort of our normative infrastructure. It's our norms and values and institutions and social practices, all the stuff that we use to organize our life together. All these norms and values and rules that we take especially seriously, right? So it's not just traffic rules that could be this way or that way, but the ones that are really, really important to us, that's the moral part of our normative infrastructure. And one of the main themes that, that I touch upon repeatedly in the book is what is sometimes referred to sort of technically, or in technical terms, as the scalability of cooperative structures. I think it's a very unusual fact about, about us as a species. It's basically unique about us as a species that we can and have lived in very, very different types of groups. Very small groups with almost no economic development of only a dozen people. Up until present day society where you have a billion people cooperating with each other to manufacture certain goods, for instance, and they're never gonna meet each other, they don't know each other's names, they will remain perfect strangers forever. And yet we have built a normative infrastructure that enables us to cooperate at that scale. And so you can also see that kind of structure, not just as a temporal structure, but also to some extent, more or less, as a scalability story of smaller groups becoming larger. And I try to explain what kinds of institutions and tricks we came up with in order to make that scaling up possible. Am I in the right direction? No. So again, I start with not even humans, but our pre-human, proto-human ancestors that at a certain point in time, a couple million years ago, spliced away from their last shared common ancestor with the other great apes. And they were geographically likely isolated in a novel, more volatile, riskier environment and climate in East Africa which meant that there, all of a sudden there was intense pressure to seek strength in numbers, to become more cooperative as a, as a species, to um, share resources, to pool risks, and to just generally collaborate more with each other as a means of protection. And it took, it took um, biologists and psychologists and philosophers and economists quite a long time to understand how um, tricky that problem actually is. First, you need to realize how unstable and fragile um, co 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 uh, cooperation actually is. Because it, it, it remains true in general back then, but also today, that the best option is always to benefit from other people contributing to the common good, but not contribute to the common good yourself. Basically, this is sometimes described as a prisoner's dilemma or as a collective action problem. There are these collective action problems and they always have the same structure, which is that it's in everyone's individual interest not to contribute to the common good. And since that is, in fact, in each individual's interest, cooperation tends to be very, very unstable and you need to understand the mechanisms that make cooperation possible in the first place to overcome these collective action problems. And in small groups, there are basically, there are more, but the, ma the main ones are kinship and reciprocity. So we help people that are related to us because they, um, they um, carry our genes. And we are, well, we are the people that, we are the offspring of people who cared about their offspring, right? Uh, and the individuals that didn't care about their offspring, 
their ancestors aren't here uh, because they're, <laughs> they're no longer around, right? So you have this one mechanism that kinship structures, just relatedness, creates an intensive uh, stabilizing mechanism for one individual to help another because you are helping copies of your genes. And we are basically the vehicles that were built by our selfish genes in order to make that happen. So sometimes people say that um, uh, this is like sort of a chicken and egg way of illustrating that story. And um, the idea is that an egg isn't the way for a chicken to make another chicken, but a chicken is the way for an egg to make another egg. So you have a whole different paradigm and understanding of the role of genes in evolution. And since we are very, very um, strongly related to our uh, siblings and parents and uh, especially children, that explains why we are intensely motivated to care for them, help them and share resources with them and cooperate with them. And another important mechanism is reciprocity. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. You help me today, I help you tomorrow. I help you today, you help me tomorrow, right? So you have these chains of reciprocity. And as long, and this is the important part, as long as you have small groups, these types of mechanisms, kinship, family, and reciprocity, they can stabilize cooperation in small groups and solve these collective action, action problems. But you also immediately see the limits, the scalability limits of these types of processes. Once you have 100 people in a group, or 500 people in a group, Kinship is going to be far too weak to integrate that, right? Reciprocity is going to be far too difficult to track and to sort of keep book about who did what yesterday, did I? And these collective action problems, they intensify, and it becomes much easier for anyone to get away with, you know, slacking off and not doing anything, right? So you immediately see that we have another problem. Once we have cooperation solved at the smallest level, at the most basic level, Groups grow because they do better, and they need to find new mechanisms in order to once again stabilize cooperation at that higher scale, at that larger um, group size. And that's why punishment comes into play, because punishment, of course, is a very useful way to um, change the equation of this prisoner's dilemma collective action problem structure, because it's of course good for me to, to benefit from the com common good without making my own contribution. But when I get punished for that very intensely, then it's no longer in my interest to do so, right? So again, you have punishment that plays a dual role in stabilizing cooperation in increasingly larger groups of maybe 50 members, maybe 100, um, maybe 150 members. And these, this, this dual function is, like I said, on the one hand, if it is, if you can organize it that people will be punished for slacking off and for not making their contribution and for being a free rider, you are changing the incentives themselves. But we also now have good reason to think that that whole system kicked off a process of so-called self-domestication. Basically, we are to we are a kind of golden retriever to a wolf, right? Um, just like golden retrievers relate to wolves, so do we, I mean, look at us, look at everyone in this room, so do we relate to the other great apes, right? Almost, no, one, no, no one has hair, right? People are intensely conformist and kind of friendly. You can all sit here for an extended period of time and be quiet and listen and there's no fracas and there's no, no, um, no struggle and no aggression, so there's enormous impulse control. And the way that we achieve that most likely, is just by killing the most aggressive members in our group. And if you do that for 500,000 years, you are thereby creating intense selection pressure in favor of people who are less aggressive, more conformist, more friendly, more cooperative, and just more easygoing, right? And this is essentially what happens, what happened to us at the point where we learned how to cooperate, we also learned to form small coalitions to off the wannabe tyrants that we didn't want to have around anymore. Once we learned how to hunt with spears and weapons, we also became really skilled murderers of people in our own group. And again, when you cycle that and you repeat that over and over and over again and you kill off the most aggressive 
and most impulsive members of your group, you, you kick off this process of self-domestication, and after a couple of thousands, a hundred, hundred thousand years, you end up with a being that isn't rid of aggression, but much of the aggression is controlled, it's more deliberate, it's channeled usually towards outsiders, and it's, um, it's, it's mostly used for, for, for punishment itself, which, which can be, and for most of our history, was uh, much more, um, well, imaginative than uh, punishment is today. You see this picture here of, a, um, of an execution from the 1750s in, on the main square, uh, one of the main squares in Paris that uh, Michel Foucault starts his book, Crime and Punishment, with, and it's quite something. Uh, people really thought about it. How, how are we going to kill this guy? Uh, and, they, and they made it work. It was quite a show. There was thousands of people there, and they clapped. Still, punishment isn't isn't the only isn't isn't the isn't sufficient to to um, continue to engage in that further increase in group size, that further scaling up of our cooperative structures. So, at some point, um, we became an intensely cultural species. So we're not just unique in that we can live in all kinds of different groups, but part of the reason for why we can do that is because we are essentially unique in that we are um, a, a, an animal that is capable um, of culture, and not just any culture, but cumulative culture. So we can not just create this cultural reservoir of knowledge and skills and practices and rituals and institutions, but we can also transmit that reservoir to the next generation. We can transmit that knowledge horizontally within one and the same generation, and, and this is the crucial part, and the next generation can make tiny improvements. And that's the part that you see nowhere else in the animal kingdom, where you have the cumulative part, right? You have animals that sometimes have social learning and they have dialects and they have certain techniques, and they sometimes learn them from other members of their group, but the kind of accumulation of knowledge and skill capital that we see in human beings, we don't see that anywhere else. And the flip side of that is that, on the other hand, we have all these deficits. There's a famous term that's been around for, for 200 years, uh, a, a, bit, a bit more, a, a German word um, that is Mengelwesen, which basically means a being that uh, with deficits, a deficient being. So we don't have these instincts, right? For at least 12 years, usually more, we are completely useless. We can't do anything. Uh, we don't know anything. We don't contribute to, um, to society. We have no knowledge, no skills. We are intensely dependent. We are utterly dependent for the first couple of years. and can't do anything. You see, you know, a newborn horse, they stand up and they are good to go. Right? Uh, after two days, or I don't even know, a couple of hours, they stand up and they're like a horse, just smaller. Uh, we can't do any of that, right? We are intensely dependent on absorbing, downloading all of this knowledge from our cultural reservoir that was built over generations. And an interesting consequence of that is that much of our culture is opaque to us, it's intransparent to us. We don't really understand how it works. We know almost everything we know, our language, anything. 99.9 .9 and something percent that we know, we know from other people, horizontally transmitted or vertically transmitted, from friends, from parents, from grandparents, and so on and so on. And we are intensely dependent on that kind of knowledge. And that cultural reservoir, it was built over so many generations that usually we don't know why we do things the way we do things, and we don't know what makes them work. We only know that they do work which is, for instance, a reason that it's so difficult to import, to export certain institutions, right? You can't go to a place and, 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 and tell people, look, this is democracy, now do it, right? It needs to grow over centuries and often um, millennia, and we, we, we don't know how it works. We don't know why certain cooking recipes exist. We don't know why institutions function uh, the way they do, so we can't design them because this cultural process is way above our heads, it, it goes beyond what people can understand or reinvent in, at an individual level or even generational level. And this shows that to a large extent, um, the individualism of the Enlightenment, 
you know, dare to know, think for yourself, is largely not good advice, right? You should usually not think for yourself. That, 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 that way lies disaster. Uh, you should almost always learn from other people. And the, the challenge is, the trick is to determine whom to learn from. But to think for yourself is a road that literally leads nowhere. All you can ho ever hope for is to maybe make a tiny, tiny, the tiniest improvement to this body of knowledge that we have. And otherwise, you shouldn't use your own mind and reason, but you should, whenever you can, use other people's minds and reason. And that's how um, human progress has always worked. But that's a good thing. Now, we also think that, um, or oh, the evidence, the best available evidence that we have right now suggests that for most of our history, we used to live in fairly pleasant conditions, you know, not a long work day, pretty good diet, or oh, child mortality, that was always a big thing for, for humans because of our big heads that we need for all the, for all the learning from others. Um, so that's always been a problem, but in many ways, life was pretty good 100,000 years ago in hunter-gatherer societies. And that leads us to the question of why did we ever leave those types of conditions? In particular, we now think that we know that in terms of social equality, political equality, economic equality, also to a, to a surprisingly large extent, gender equality, these very ancient societies 100,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, they were pretty good, right? You didn't have systematic oppression. You, you had some division of labor between men and women, for instance, but you didn't have this sort of intense um, division um, in, um, in terms of social inequality that we have seen for the longest time for the past thousands of years in, in most human societies. And the question is, why did we leave these conditions? The, the American anthropologist Jared Diamond says that leaving those conditions and starting larger societies that are sedentary, so they don't move around so much, sedentary and are based on agriculture was the worst mistake of all time. And to some, I mean, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but to some extent, for the vast majority of people, it was a terrible deal. People had freedom and autonomy to a large extent. They could hunt, they could hang out, they could tell stories, uh, take care of the kids, and so on and so on. Like I said, pretty good life. And life in these early empires and civilizations was just dreadful for the vast majority of people. People were slaving away, toiling away in the fields under, under, the, under the, the crack of the whip. They had to you know, give, give away almost all of their harvest. There was terrible diseases that came up with living together and domesticating um, animals and living together with domesticated animals. And the economic surplus that for the first time in human history really was, um, was a, a yield of the economic activity was largely appropriated by the first social elites. Basically, once we settled down and started working the fields, you generate an economic surplus. Then you get these tiny coalitions that sometimes huddle together and they say, okay, we're gonna be the elites now and we're gonna take most of that stuff, right? Then that creates some extra demand for the first kind of class of intellectuals and ideologues and, um, and priests and philosophers whose main job for most of the time was just to legitimize oppression. So for the most part, that's what philosophers have been doing is come up with clever sounding arguments for why it's just all right that some people are doing fine, but very few, and the vast majority of people are collapsing under the weight of their burden and they don't get to keep anything for themselves. And people had this you know, need for this demand for some sort of narrative to explain, well, if I must, you know, suffer endlessly, maybe there's going to be an afterlife and I'm going to be redeemed and it's all going to be fine. And the first ideologues and intellectuals came up with that kind of narrative and catered to that um, kind of demand. And a lot of people are wondering, are we stuck in these conditions? So for the past 10, 12,000 years, really taking off 5,000 years ago in various places, um, on this planet, we have been living under these conditions of dramatic political and material inequality. And so far, we haven't found a way, a new way, besides going back to hunter-gatherer 
communes, so to speak, we haven't found a way of organizing this type of society with all the perks and benefits, right? All the nice stuff, all the pleasantries, without intense and dramatic and stark economic and political inequality. And there is a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, recent book by David Graeber and David Wengro called The Dawn of Everything, where they address this question in, in more detail. Are we stuck? Is it really true that if we enter this type of society that I guess few of us would want to abandon and leave behind? Does that mean that we need to accept this type of dramatic political and material inequality? They say no. I think that very well may be the Faustian bargain that we have to engage in. And I don't think that we really have a good idea of how to come up with a society that generates these types of benefits without at the same time as an unintended and unwanted side effect also generating these extreme forms of inequality in wealth and power. Now, well, social theorists and political philosophers have, and other intellectuals, cultural theorists, have ever since the dawn of modern societies with economic growth, capitalism, technological innovation, science, modern science, have wondered why is it that this process kicked off at all? Why is it that it kicked off so late? And why is it that it kicked off where it kicked off? And you have different kinds of explanations that people have offered. One famous one is by Max Weber, who wrote this book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, where he argued there is a cultural value kind of foundation to the emergence of capitalism, because making money and making a profit is something that was conceptualized as some sort of um, theistic benefit. Not that you can influence God to accept you into paradise, but the Protestant idea is that by being successful in this world, you have evidence that you have already been predetermined to be accepted into paradise, right? So it's not a causal thing. You can't, you can't, you know, influence God. We are far too small for that. But we can read off of our worldly success that we may be among the chosen few, right? And that created the sort of the cultural foundation for this intense drive to profit and to engage in economic activity. And that, in the end, could have created. Um, modern societies with all its unique and unusual characteristics, and it created modern societies in this part of the world, namely mostly in Western and Central Europe, and then later on the, the colonial offshoots of Western and Central Europe in the US and, and, um, and Australia and so on and so on. But I think that, first of all, it doesn't explain where the Protestant ethic comes from, right? You already need that, and that's already quite an unusual phenomenon, a kind of religion that you don't find anywhere else um, in the world, very intellectual, very based, very individualist, right? You need to read the book yourself and understand it yourself, um, and so on and so on. So that's already an unusual um, um, thing, to, thing to have, but it also wasn't really that well supported by empirical evidence, and I think we now have a truly impressive and astonishing theory that was um, explained at length in a book that came out in 2020, I believe, by Joseph Henrik. Uh, the book is called The Weirdest People in the World, and he means you. Uh, and the reason for that is that weird is an acronym. It doesn't just mean unusual, but it stands for Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic people. And the question is, where do these weird people come from? And he has an explanation that is extremely well supported by the evidence, and that is really extremely counterintuitive and extremely surprising, which is why it's so great that it's so well supported by actual very, very detailed and very, very statistically sophisticated empirical evidence from all sorts of disciplines. Very, very briefly, the story is that for some reason, we don't really know exactly why, other than at a certain point it seemed to pay off. For some reason, um, around 500, so 1500 years ago, give or take, the Catholic Church, it wasn't Catholic then, it was the Western Christian Church, started to destroy the remaining kinship and clan structures that were the organizing principle of European society, as they were of society anywhere 
and everywhere. They start. They they did so, for instance, by um, banning cousin marriage, first cousins, then second, then third, up until sixth cousins. They changed the inheritance rules to break up large family fort fortunes that conveniently you could give to the church to gain entrance to heaven. Um, and they just had this whole campaign that Joseph Hendrick refers to as the marriage and family program of the Western church to destroy the kinship and clan structures of Western and Central Europe. And that created a vacuum in which new institutions that are not based on kinship, but that are based on basically joining voluntarily are based. And these types of institutions are cities. They are clubs, corporations, monasteries, universities, and also markets. And the idea is that by engaging in this act, that without foresight, they didn't know that that would be the consequence of destroying the kinship and clan structures in Western Europe. At the same time, the Western church made room for these institutions that are, again, much more scalable because they are not based on kinship and clan structure, which is always a bit fragile, you know, at the fringes. But you, all of a sudden you had institutions that generated all these sophisticated scientific knowledge, and it wasn't based on kinship, right? So you didn't have to agree with the next person because that's your brother, right? And you didn't have to trade differently with the next person because that's your cousin, right? But all the new rules were based on a novel understanding that wasn't based on kinship and um, clan belonging, and that cre created, most likely, played a huge role, the dominant role, in creating modernity with all its modern institutions like science, like economic growth, capitalism, but also um, democracy and political participation. You just have to think about how weird the idea was at the time that that society could be based on a kind of social contract. Evidently, it's not, right? There never was such a contract. You didn't sign one. No one ever did. But you see that the need, in this novel understanding Society isn't just something we inherit that's based on God-given rules and there's a family on top, right? Like a king and his kid is going to be king, right? That was the way of the world for the longest time. And all of a sudden you have people thinking about society as, a, as an enterprise for mutual benefit, right? And you're asking yourself, okay, that type of society, would I have joined that society, right? Would I have signed that contract? And that becomes the new standard for evaluating political structures and social practices, which are very far from perfectly implemented even today, certainly back in the day. But you see that novel understanding that started to take hold and really fundamentally reshaped society and created the modern world with all its benefits and horrors. I also wanted to say a few things, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to sort of touch on these um, on these theme, themes very briefly. Um, um, wanted to discuss the main lessons, um, of what I think are the main lessons of the 20th century, with its um, horrors and catastrophes. And I think that basically after the First and Second World War, um, people really, again, very imperfectly and very slowly and in a very frustrating and, 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 um, and by no means impartial and fair way, but they at least made an earnest effort, I think, to really heed the lessons of the first half of the 20th century, where they saw with, just, just in the most spectacular way, had another example of the moral risks that come with thinking about society in terms of us and them, in terms of ethnic and racial categories in terms of ethnic and racial hierarchies of superior people and inferior people. And so people really try to break down these, bar these barriers, these morally irrelevant distinction between ethnicities, um, people's skin color, races. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as the expanding circle of moral status. The idea is that Moral status, you know, to have all the moral rights and to be important in society and to be taken into consideration by other people. And there used to be this privilege of a few people, right, male of a certain age, you need to have property, you need to, needed to belong to this, to, to this um, citizenry or be of a certain skin color and so on and so on. And all of a sudden, these types of barriers were at least attempted to... Um, to be broken down and to expand the circle of moral status and to 
um, have a kind of dynamic of inclusion that realizes that people are all equal and that we should construct society very much around that idea that there are no fundamental distinctions in moral worth between people and at a certain point in time, even um, between different species, right? So at a, at a certain point in time, you also start to realize, well, what is the morally relevant difference between human beings as a species and all the other species such that we are allegedly entitled to kill them and eat them, right? Um, and a lot of people have since adopted this, this concept of speciesism that is supposed to be analogous to racism, sexism, and all the other isms, and supposed to express this idea that the distinction between different types of species is also not morally relevant and moral status cuts across species boundaries. And I think at least another very important idea that philosophers and especially social psychologists have tried to understand in the second half of the 20th century is that it takes so surprisingly little to get completely normal people to do the most atrocious things, right? It's a very common thing now, but that was also a kind of discovery that people had, is that you don't need evil people, moustache-twirling villains in order to commit horrible acts. You can just tell people, and they'll do it, right? There doesn't even have to be much of a threat. You only need to be sort of a bit conformist. We didn't just need to be a normal a normal person. And the, 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 the mechanisms of being a normal person are when the, con when the conditions are right, or rather wrong, problematic, they are sufficient to make perfectly ordinary people do these horrible acts. And that was, um, I think, very well captured in this um, phrase, the banality of evil that Hannah Arendt coined um, as a description of uh, the bureaucrats that ran the concentration camps, and in particular, um, Eichmann, whose trial she witnessed in, um, in Jerusalem. And then a third thing is that there's been an, an, an increasing and ongoing, still ongoing effort to um, find out which of our moral norms in society are only supposedly moral, but they are actually not really morally important or morally significant, and then to try to demoralize them, right? So to see, okay, which of the rules we live by are really important and, and, and morally significant, and which of these rules can be lifted, and we can just tell people to obey them or not, right? Certain um, restrictions on sexual behavior, for instance, right? We're usually intensely moralized to behave one way and only one way, basically, Right? And people realize that ah, maybe that's not so important, morally speaking. You know, if people want to do it and no one's harmed, let, let, let them. Uh, and that th I think that, de that effort of demoralization, I think, is still ongoing and is also, um, in many cases, um, has been a good development and a good idea. And now, with the, with the final chapter of the book, uh, and I try to be very, very short here, um, we are we are reaching um, this this territory of um, all of these fraud topics that people that people panic about a lot, wokeness and identity politics. And I wanted to, well, at least that was the aim in the book. I wanted to offer a treatment of these topics of these of recent shifts in how we relate to each other and how we talk about um, each other. What you can still say and what you allegedly can't say. I wanted to develop an evaluation of these developments that tries to be as fair and impartial as possible, tries to identify some of the ideas in these developments that are good and some of the ideas that are maybe not so good or maybe increasingly bizarre and unnecessary and, and off-putting, and to um, stay away from sort of taking sides in these culture wars, either on the, on the hyper-woke side or on the anti-woke um, you know, identity politics is the end of civilization as we know it, and so on and so on, and crowd, right? The people get really upset when they need to, like, use a different word, right? Uh, so I wanted to stay sort of in the middle between these two and just try to understand what is going on and why it's happening. And one interesting idea that was proposed recently by the American um, social scientist Peter Turchin was that much of these struggles wokeness, identity politics, and so on and so on, progressive social movements, social justice, inclusion, and so on and so on. Much of these developments can be attributed to a phenomenon that he refers to as elite overproduction. What you have is, in any society for the past thousands of years, 
you had social elites who had most power in society and ran the shop, basically. But the longer you have them, the more these elites, they tend to rig all of these social institutions in their favor. Turchin calls this the wealth pump, right? So wealth increasingly starts to flow upwards. Privileges and rights and entitlements increasingly start to flow upwards. And what that means is that these elite positions, as a result, become more and more attractive. So there are going to be more and more people who want to join these elites, who want to get on the gravy train, right? And that is basically a dynamic that is headed for, um, for disaster, because at a certain point in time, the number of people who aspire to join these elites is much larger than the number of spots, as it were, available in these higher social ranks. So what you get is a, client, a kind of class struggle organized by disappointed people who aspire to join the elites but didn't get to. Right? So class struggle isn't even run by the worst off in society, it's by the second best off, right? who didn't get to join the elite um, mainstream. I think there's something, something to this idea of elite overproduction, but then again, these types of developments towards more inclusion and equality and so on and so on, they happened everywhere, not just in specific places where this kind of elite overproduction phenomenon could be observed. So I think that largely what we see is that we see that, and there's lots of empirical evidence for this, that as societies become economically richer and politically more stable, there is a shift away from, from tradition and survival and security values in a direction of so-called emancipatory values, liberty, autonomy, individuality, authenticity, free self-expression, and so on and so on. And these types of value shifts they lead to a re-evaluation of society as a whole. We, d we then notice that societies with, with their very problematic inheritance of inequality and oppression and disadvantage that we get from the past, that societies are very difficult to redesign, to re-engineer and to change very much. That leads to an enormous amount of frustration that makes people want to change at least something so social elites and academics and intellectuals start changing the stuff that is most easy to change, which is the way that we talk about each other, right? And so all of a sudden you get these linguistic cosmetic changes, many of which are not so bad, but you see that a lot of the attention is redirected towards this sim symbolic territory and you get these intense culture war fights um, about land acknowledgements of uh, universities that stand on indigenous land or stuff like that, right? I don't know if you are, if you follow the culture wars as closely as I, as I have for the, for the past couple of years. I don't recommend it, um, but there's a lot of, there's, there's it's, it's something. Um, there's a lot of bizarre stuff um, out there. But in principle, this idea is good. In principle, you do want modern society to conform more closely to these ideas of inclusion and equality and justice, right? It shouldn't make a difference to how your life goes, whether you are an immigrant or what the color of your skin is, right? These are good ideas. And I think I, th I would be very surprised if people in this room didn't 100% agree with these, right? It's just a difficult question how you act strategically and, pra and pragmatically in order to bring currently existing society into closer conformity with these otherwise really well justified ideals. And I think that kind of frustration and impatience that results from that um, gap between what we know society should be like and what we see society is like, that creates this intense symbolic struggle that we are currently um, witnessing. It's a bit of an open question whether we have already reached so-called peak woke, so sort of the most extreme version of woke. I tend to think probably yes. You see, to, to, to some extent, like any social movement, it loses momentum. You get a bunch of people who sort of lose faith in the cause. Crazier and crazier people join the movement, making more and more bizarre claims, right? I don't want to ridicule it, but you see that kind of dynamic um, in place. That, in turn, undermines further popular support, so it just loses steam, and then there comes a time when people just sort of think about, okay, what were the good ideas? Yeah, greater vigilance when it comes to 
sexual um, um, assault, for instance, that seems to be a gain that people don't want to reverse. For instance, that seems to be a good idea, right? That the culture has changed um, to to a large extent um, in that sense. And then other ideas, uh, like I said, about which costumes you get to wear, they they are perhaps less important, and they and they probably won't be around for for much longer. So this is the basic story that I wanted to tell. This is how I think all these elements of, of, of morality, a punitive social sanctions, um, a willingness to cooperate and live together with other people, a very strong distinction between us and them, who belongs to our group, who belongs to their group, this dynamic of further and further um, inclusion in society comes together in a novel way in society and it just seems especially confusing and intense to us because we are living in it right now. But I'm hoping that if we zoom out a little bit, we can understand it um, better and we can, we can be more relaxed about the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hanno. We have half an hour for uh, questions and answers, and I would like to start off with, uh, with a question, Hanno. You say people, um, let's say morality exists because we are social beings and we want to, we have to cooperate with each other. But how do you look at the polarization of today? Since nowadays, even if you, uh, yeah, if you look at, for example, the, 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 the the US, yes, wow. <laughs> um, they don't seem to be willing to cooperate in any, any way. Yes, uh, I, think, I think that's one of the most commonly offered diagnoses for what's wrong with current society is that we are so intensely polarized. I think there's something to it. I don't think that's entirely made up, but I also think that this diagnosis is exaggerated and overstated. And what I mean by that is that when we look at the empirical evidence, we see that uh, social and political polarization is mostly not a phenomenon where people's views become more extreme. It's mostly a phenomenon where people's views become more homogenous. More? So, more homogenous. So, that, so it's polar, polarization is not um, an extremist phenomenon, people drifting apart in the severity of their views. It's mostly um, a problem that, um, a, a problem of sorting. So people sort very cleanly into different types of groups. And so you don't have much overlap anymore between different political parties, for instance. That's especially strong as a phenomenon, of course, in the US, where due to the peculiarities of the voting system, you basically have this two-party system, which makes this distinction between the one side and the other side very salient. And then the more we read the news and so on and so on, the better we are informed about what the other side believes so that we can sort of choose to believe the other thing. So polarization is not really our, our views becoming more extreme, but our views becoming more clearly clustered in different political groups. And this is called partisan sorting. Um, but also polarization, I think, is exaggerated because we see the most extreme voices because they are the loudest, right? So when you have 1% over here who have very extreme, say, leftist beliefs, whatever, and 1% of people who have very extreme conservative right-wing beliefs on the other um, side, we hear them because they post, right? Uh, they're intensely motivated and, and ideologically um, um, driven. And the 98% in the middle who are sort of more moderate and they could figure it out together, we don't hear from them uh, as much. So the phenomenon is mostly one of sorting and clustering rather than views becoming more extreme. And even that um, is something that still seems more extreme than it, it actually is. So when, when, yeah, like I said, when, when, you, when you spend your, 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 most of your waking hours doom scrolling on Twitter, uh, you'll get the idea that people, you know, everyone's losing it. Um, but in fact, uh, the vast majority of people is kind of middle of the road and kind of vanilla. Um, and and they are they are much less polarized um, than we are told they are. All right, I will go to the to the room in the back. Yeah. 
Um, do you see an end to the problem of scalability? It seems like the scalability is intrinsically destructive. Um, I don't know if you see it that way, um, but um, is there an end to it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't say that's, that, that, that scaling up cooperation is inherently destructive. Often um, there is also strength in numbers and people are safer and, 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 you, and you get to... Um, so, for instance, mo mo you know, modern scientific knowledge isn't possible without thousands and thousands of people working together on these questions, right? So you already need a huge society around that to even make that possible because not everyone can be a scientist. Um, likewise, if you want to have full-time artists, musicians, and so on and so on and so on, you need to have a large group with huge division, division of labor to, to even make that possible. So I don't think it's entirely destructive. Of course, scaling up cooperation does and has often in the past meant that, um, meant environmental destruction, for instance. And in many cases, societies have also collapsed or reverted to a lower level of social organization because they started to become too good at exploiting resources around them, cutting down trees, um, making animals going uh, extinct, and so on and so on and so on. So there is a destructive aspect to growing in numbers, but that's also a kind of like a normal thing about just growing. You need more resources, you need more energy, uh, and you, you consume more. So there's going to be, you know, these points where, where, where different groups run up against the limits of what their social institutions can support. And then some of these groups don't make the transition, and some do. And now, right now, we have, for the first time in human history, um, and that's what I thought you meant with the end of scalability, to some extent we have reached a, a, a really strong planetary limit of scaling up um, cooperation. Because at, when, when you reach a point where you can cooperate at a global scale with billions of people, right, and the energy consumption that you need in order to sustain that, you also see that your environmental problems become global, right? And so we are currently in that phase in history. It's our first try. I guess it's our only try. <laughs> so we'll see how that's gonna how that's gonna turn out. But we are currently trying to scale up cooperation in a way that is environmentally sustainable. I'm kind of optimistic that that is possible, but it's very much an open question since we know from history that, in many cases, groups of people and civilizations and empires have not succeeded at this task. Oh, wait. And, well, what what I mean, what is, the, it, is it like? It's it's a positive feedback loop, and yeah. Well, I mean, uh, so you solve one problem, and it's going to grow again. And no. yeah, yeah. But I mean, that society that maybe comes after people sometimes say you're not going to like what comes after America, right? Uh, so if we so you know, it's very easy to say we need to completely reform society, but it's an open question whether the thing that comes after is going to be preferable, right? With all the problems that society right now. Um, has, and the perfect is the enemy of the good, right? So sometimes people try to bring about paradise uh, um, uh, on uh, on planet Earth, and in trying to to do so, uh, they they end up um, producing catastrophic effects. So um, it's 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 it, it would be very speculative to have a have a have a take on what would come after. A globe after there has been a global civilization, right? Already, um, it could be some sort of reversion to different forms of life that are much bleaker, perhaps, also much simpler. But it's very—it's just very difficult to predict that. Um, right now, the question that we are facing, and it's not like we're not doing anything. We are trying to build institutions again, very imperfectly and very slowly. But there are attempts to build institutions globally to solve this collective action problem at the planetary scale. Um, and we'll just see whether or not um, that succeeds. But I don't think that scaling up cooperative structures is in general a destructive process. Um, the, the title of your lecture was The World History of Morality, but is this analysis not more Western focused in a way? Um, the, it's, it's, it's a fair question that I've also struggled with. Um, partly, yes. I think, oh, well, when you look at these timescales, for the most part, it's global, right? But in the final chapters, it does increasingly concentrate on, on Western so society. 
that has various reasons, most of it due to my own competence or lack thereof when it comes to speaking about other places. Um, that's really, that's it. Um, but the, the nicer version is that there could also be a systematic reason that justifies that because when you talk about, you know, the emergence of empires, you talk about a global phenomenon, but you focus on Mesopotamia or something like that, right? So for the, for, so for the time being, you focus on the hotspots of that type of development that you want to talk about. And when we want to talk about modern economic institutions and technological innovation and scientific knowledge, the current hotspot just happens to be Western Europe and so on, right? I know that there is a version of that claim that I just made that is sort of problematic a bit, right? And sort of Euro Eurocentric and ethnocentric. But I think really one of the strengths of um, Henrik's The Weirdest People in the World story is that it's not ethnocentric. There's nothing about people of a certain type that makes them intrinsically better at coming up with science or something. There's no race stuff in there, right? It's entirely cultural phenomenon. You see that in different um, 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 variations also in other places. It's just most intensely concentrated in this one place. Um, uh, but in principle, um, there's nothing ethnocentric or Eurocentric inherently about this story. As it happens, much of the later chapters are focused on um, Western society, which is also pretty big, right? Um, and yeah, it's a combination of me not knowing that much about, about reality, <laughs> uh, the rest of the world, um, and also, I think that there may be systematic reasons if you do it right, right? So if you don't come up with, you know, the white man brings the good news and so on and so on. Any more questions? Um, do you see that moral values are shifting more rapidly in the current day? And if so, do you think there are any issues that could arise from that rapid shift? Yeah, good question. I mean, also hard to judge because when you're in it, it seems faster, right? You see the sort of the you see the broad strokes and the and the sort of glacial flow of societies because you're far away, and you and you say, well, for and then for five thousand years there was this, right? Uh, and now we see, you know, every day. Oh, can I still say homeless? Or do I have to say housing deprived? Stuff like that, right? And there was yesterday, homeless was fine. Um, so it's, it feels very quick, but it may seem, in hindsight may flatten and seem very insubstantial, right? And we forget a lot about it. So it's difficult to, to answer in that sense. But also, there could be a systematic reason for why social change could, in one sense, be more rapid, in another sense, be slowed down. So again, the greater your scale of cooperation is, the more um, potential for innovation you have in principle, right? So the, the velocity of cultural innovation could... Um, could, could accelerate and, and, and could, could become more and more um, rapid. There are even some people who say that's what we see and it's a problem for culture because we don't see these long-term trends anymore, right? We have memes, but they last like six hours, right? And then it's the next one. Um, and in that kind of society, with that velocity of cultural change, you never have these big trends and subcultures that form around these trends, right? Which makes the culture feel hollow. It makes everything feel arbitrary, right? So people, people sometimes... So, so, so my, my, my kids, they wear Nirvana t-shirts, right? They have no idea who Nirvana were, right? But that's a big phenomenon that was huge for a couple of years, right? Hugely influential. Um, and you see that those types of big trends may be disappearing because the velocity of cultural change is too quick, so nothing sticks. That's one thing. But also, the other side of that coin is... The, the larger societies become, the more complex they become, the more bureaucratically organized, because that's how you, you grow large, you need to run it, right? You need to have an administration, a political system, and so on and so on and so on. You have people who are very privileged and who don't want to lose and risk these privileges. So there may also be different forces that slow down cultural and social change on the other side of the, of the scale. I can't answer your question whether, whether I think in general um, it gets quicker, for, for, the, for the reasons that I try to try to um, uh, try to sketch, but it's an interesting. It could also be both, right? It could be, you know, online you have stuff goes viral and then peters out, but all of society becomes very very difficult to steer and to and to change, and you see that, yeah, 
again, in the US, for instance, people often say, and there's a lot, of, lot to, to it, nothing gets done, right? They pass no laws politically, right? Uh, there's just um, stagnation and stalemate because institutions calcify and they become kind of, yeah, overly rigid and can't cope with, um, with the problems that they were supposed they were, they were supposed to solve, um, actually, difficult question, but yeah, it's it's an interesting one. And do you do you also think that now we are living in in a digital age eh, for a few decades? Does that have as a certain other influence on how morality develops than until until a few decades ago? Yeah, I mean, it's also a huge question. I mean, I mean, we, we um, I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, this is pretty pretty. Analog, right? I mean, we use technology to aid a presentation, but it's basically the way that it used to be done 500 years ago as well, right? There's a guy who says things. Um, it's not very digital, uh, but of course, um, it's 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 also a very new development, and we'll have to see what the consequences of those developments are. There is a great line in Jürgen Habermas's recent book, the, I think it's called The New Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere or something like that, where he said that, just think about um, the invention of uh, the printing press with movable letters. Huge innovation. All of a sudden, uh, you could produce books um, at, a, at, a, at a whole different level and increase affordability of books. Now, again, we look back at that and think, oh, that was a great innovation and people were you know, all, all of a sudden people had access to all this information. But of course, the books that were printed back then were, hor you know, horrendous. They were just like, you know, completely useless dreck and drivel. Um, and the idea that Habermas has in this, um, uh, um, in this book is we invented um, the printing press, but it took a couple of centuries even for everyone in society to learn how to be a reader, right? And now we have this digital transformation of the public sphere, very new technology, right? It's 10 years old, basically. And we have this powerful tool that at the, in the beginning, people would also say, oh, now we can finally radically have um, um, uh, alter democracy and everyone can, be, can, can raise their voice and so on and so on. And Habermas says, it's exactly the same phenomenon. We have a similar transformation. It's just that what we now see is that Everyone needs to learn how to write, right? Everyone needs to learn how to be an author in the way that it used to be only 0.1% of people that were authors. Just like 700 years ago, it, it was only 1% of society that were readers, right? And so likewise, you see that these, these, these um, social and technological transformations, they happen, people have great hopes in them, and then they turn out to be neither entirely bad nor entirely good, but people just need to adapt to these novel um, institutions. They need to get used to um, how false information spreading in novel ways. Uh, we're going to need to get. We're going. We're going to have to get used to um, re-evaluating the evidential power of um, videos, for instance. So it used to be. You know, he said, she said, but if one had a video, it was like, yeah, you win, right? Uh, you won the argument, it happened, right? But that's going to be very different very, very soon. Um, so, but people are going to adapt to that as well. It's not like people for the coming hundred years are going to, you know, keep falling for these fake videos, just like they used to believe the real videos because they weren't any, any, any others. So we're going to adapt to these, um, to these developments and a fully digital age, I mean, yeah, people fantasize about, you know, basically everyone in society is just plugged into VR uh, and that's going to be life um, from then on in, into, into a, a virtual reality. And we're all going to just like float in this, in this new solution and have the goggles on. Um, uh, I mean, again, who knows? Um, uh, I, but here too, it feels nightmarish, but it could also be, you know, partly good, partly bad. All right, yeah. Um, well, uh, you have about uh, that the church uh, start to uh, break the family structures, and you uh, put this on five hundred years, and you mention Max Weber, and Max Weber indeed write about uh, the uh, Protestantism in relation to capitalism, but um, 
Christianity is 2,000 years old and Judaism is even older. So my uh, question is, is that this break with kinship, is this a really a matter of uh, religion? Or is it uh, just a phenomenon which perhaps has more to do with enlightenment or with capitalism or with Protestantism specifically? Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, enlightenment and capitalism, again, they must have come from somewhere. They didn't emerge everywhere at the same time, right? In, 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 their, in, their, in, their, in their paradigmatic modern form, they emerged only basically in one place, right? It, it was spread sometimes peacefully and very often violently to other places as well, but it did emerge only in one um, place. You're right that Christianity is older. Is it true that Christianity is 2,000 years old? I mean, yeah, kind of, but it's a very different institution, right? It's just a bunch of weirdos in the desert. Um, um, now we have, you know, um, these, these enormous uh, religious institutions and the, you're right, the timescales are a little bit different. Hendrik says that this process started 1,500 years ago, and it was sort of basically up and running and complete 500 years ago, which is when you see these huge transformations um, begin and where you can sort of place the origin of modern societies with their distinctively modern institutions of technological innovation, economic growth, markets, political participation increasingly, um, scientific knowledge, and um, so on and so on. So it's a product, is that a product of religion? Well, indirectly, yes, it's, it's, but it's, it's sort of religion bringing itself down, right? It's, it's religion digging its own grave because precisely the kind of ushering in the scientific way of thinking is precisely what made people increasingly realize that I don't think it makes sense that these brothels survive the earthquake of Lisbon, but these monasteries get crushed. It just, I don't think that makes sense. I don't think people get, people get sick because they behave bad. There must be something else going on. So this whole naturalistic worldview, um, I don't think the earth is at the center of the universe. And so on, so on. Um, that was all ushered in by the kinds of institutions that were inadvertently created by the Western Church breaking down these family structures such that other types of institutions could, um, could substitute that principle of organizing. So it's brought about inadvertently by religion, but it was also a very different type of religion from the, from the kind that we have today. Uh, thank you for a really inspiring uh, lecture uh, again. Um, I was... I was uh, reading your book and also re listening to to a podcast and you were then explaining the the hate maybe and jealous uh, reaction on immigrants as a evolutionary hangover could you reflect a little bit more on that <laughs> yeah so that's uh, that's a term that sometimes it's a bit tongue in cheek but it's a serious term an evolutionary hangover would be <clears throat> a, a disposition that we inherited from the psychological constraints that our, that our ancestors in different environments evolved to have. So suppose that you live, uh, two, two million years ago, you live in a society where food is scarce, calories are scarce, right? So you're gonna develop, it's, it's, it's gonna be adaptive to be very, very intensely motivated to find calories and ingest them whenever possible, right? So now take modern society, where I can buy, right now, more calories that my ancestors two million years ago would have ever encountered in their entire lives. And I need to struggle with that hangover. We still have that same disposition, right, to be intensely motivated to seek and ingest calories. But it's a total misfire in current society, because right now, calories are abundant, here for instance, uh, in, this, um, in this place, but the disposition is still there, like a hangover, right? Like, like the, the awful feeling that's still there from, from partying last night. And likewise, if you buy into this story that our normative infrastructure evolved under certain biological pressures, then again, these pressures would be, would be such that 
um, our cooperative attitudes, our willingness to share resources and incur costs for other people, would be very, very limited to a small group of people. People who are like us, that we know, that we like, that we are maybe related to, right? Some sort of group of people that we feel solidarity with, right? And now we live in societies where it's usually a good idea to have more people in the boat to contribute to the economic pie and to knowledge and whatever, right? But we still have that degree of hostility towards people that sort of like show up, right, in our camp, right? So it's a little bit that same structure that outgroup hostility is often an evolutionary hangover. Um, it's, not, not, it's not entirely that, right? Um, it's, there's no need to say that it's logically impossible that immigration would also cause social problems that need to be dealt with. I think that's perfectly possible and may even be actual in... Um, in some cases, but in general, that sort of like instinctive uh, hostile reaction towards foreigners, that is li had likely has an evolutionary component. And once we know that, we can, again, step back and ask ourselves, is it just my craving for sugar that makes me hate these brown people, right? Or is it, if you get the analogy, or is there some substance to this, to, to, to this reaction? And I'm, 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 uh, 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 um, pretty much an open borders guy. I think I think there are really excellent arguments for um, for being much more permeable in our borders and for allowing much more immigration, mostly because it benefits the immigrants. Um, they count. Um, yeah, but but that's the kind of that's the structure of the kind of explanation that you see um, that people p people in general are confused by and dislike novel foreign stuff that they are unfamiliar with. And I think in many cases, that is an impulse that is worth overriding because there are further benefits, counterintuitive benefits that don't make emotional sense that we can only get to if we override that kind of instinctive impulse. Yes. Oh. Um, so I go to the theater academy across the street and today we were talking about how perhaps we used to appropriate um, uh, stories more and I was wondering how you what your view is on identity politics with uh, politics within the arts and theater yeah um, I mean it's it's always dangerous to also um, get trapped by these um, examples that get a lot of attention in newspapers right and then some guy gets fired um, for saying something allegedly offensive and that's in the news right and so people start to panic about that and it's identity politics is ruining the arts or something like that right so so that's 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 at, at any rate a trap that i would like to avoid i'm sure that in most cases theaters are run just fine right um then again there can be some ideas which are um at least a significant influence in progressive movements such as wokeism and identity politics that are um, problematic or in some cases even incompatible with good art. For instance, the idea that um, content needs to be managed in terms of offensiveness is, I think, a very popular uh, idea. I don't know how popular, but that is a bad idea um, to make art inoffensive for even for people who are who, who belong to disadvantaged groups. Right. It's also patronizing, as if people couldn't deal with it. Right. Uh, couldn't deal with uh, with certain types of ethnic conflict in Lessing. Uh, so I don't think that's a good idea at all. Um, also, I'm 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 I have I have quite a lot of time for many of these um, goals that are associated with progressive social movements. But one thing that I kind of hate is the idea of cultural appropriation. Uh, I think. And the reason for that is that I think it's almost always beneficial to get cultures into contact, to combine them, to mix them, to... Um, it makes cultures thrive when you encourage fusion rather than division. And I think in many cases, these are ideas that people come up with. They sort of try to see, can I get away with this, right? But people, I think, largely reject them. And they think that, no, I don't think it's bad when some 
white woman makes dumplings, right? Uh, that was a real case. That was huge um, in my world. Um, it's fine, uh, right? I've made spaghetti at least once or twice in my life, and I don't want to get stoned for that, um, uh, and I shouldn't be. So I think that's that's an, it's it's in, in the in, it, well. The, the thing is that I'm in general someone who is very very big on the demoralization of art in general, right? So basically, this Oscar Wilde picture is that you know anything goes. It just needs to be, it it needs to have artistic merit. But the idea that e the people you write about need to be good people, right? Or that the bad guys need to lose, or that you can't, you, or that you need to, um, um, it, like like I said, say things that are that are um, racially, ethnically, um, sexually inoffensive, and so on and so on. I think these are ideas that are incompatible in many cases with the kind of freedom and creativity that you need. Um, need in the um, in the arts um, but otherwise to try to um, make the way that theaters are run as an institution more inclusive and so on and so on these could all be good ideas right but when it comes to art per se I think it it, it often we have so many cases Baudelaire Oscar Wilde um, um, <clears throat> just hundreds of cases where people were chastised for um, corrupting the youth and so on and so on. And I think, I think uh, all of these cases we are kind of embarrassed today uh, about and we think that, what were they thinking, right? <clears throat> uh, it just happens all the time and it's never a good idea. I saw a hand over there. Let's make this the last question. Yeah, it's you, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, if we see from very early on uh, an inclination biological and ethical towards us versus them. How can we really say that um, the emergence of inequality came about 5,000 years ago uh, since I, I see it as normal for subgroups to always form and oppress others? It, th that's right, that's right. So I meant uh, inequality in the sense of stratification, right? So, so uh, kind of vertical inequality. You have inequality between groups, right? But internally, within groups, you didn't have that much. You always had the elder and the and the and the big the best hunter and so on and so on. So there were always some sources of um, of inequality, but there were also mechanisms in place to keep compressing that kind of inequality. For instance, again, when one um, male, for instance, tried to uh, claim authority over the rest of the group, kind of be the big man, people had ways of dealing with that from ridiculing them. Um, gossiping, softer social sanctions, harsher social san sanctions, up until capital punishment. And you have, you have many, many interesting cases where one I, one I like in particular is this insulting the meat idea, is that when one guy came home with a particularly impressive kill, everyone else in the tribe would say, that's nothing, that's just bones, right? So it's like ritual humiliation of the guy who performed really well, and that maintains equality because otherwise, you know, that guy is gonna think like I'm I'm the man, right? I'm I should run this place, um, and that's there are loads loads and loads of mechanisms like that that enable smaller groups to com to to compress the inequality that was bubbling up. But again, once you scale up groups more and more, that those types of mechanisms of inequality compression they start to dis to be disabled, and then you have well, there's no there's really no going back. Because then also all the other smaller tribes they get annihilated or they or they they get enslaved and so on um, and so on. But you're right, inequality between groups uh, was always a thing. Um, but that kind of internal social stratification in 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 wealth and political power that is in in in, in those dramatic forms a more recent phenomenon that's only a thousand a couple of thousand years old. In what way do you think post-truth society affects our moral, moral progress and questions of moral responsibility? Do, in answering this question, do I need to accept that we are, in fact, living in a post-truth society? So if there were one, how would that be for um, moral progress, hypothetically speaking? Um, I mean, there is this um, idea that if you get people to believe false things, 
you can make them do wrong things, right? So here the idea is that believing falsehoods and falling for misinformation and untruths or obfuscation, whatever it is, right? Post-truth stuff. Falling for that will make people um, more susceptible to commit atrocities. And I think generally that's not the case. Generally it's the other way around, is people already want to commit atrocities and they'll find the stuff that they can believe that will justify what they already want to do, right? You don't really tell people, you don't really tell people first, oh by the way, these guys, they are disgusting cockroaches, and then say, I guess, now I'm hating them, right? It doesn't work that way. People already have that aversion and then beliefs come in that serve as suitable rationalizations for bad stuff that people already um, want to do. So I think, again, I couldn't tell you in general what I think that, hypothetically speaking, if we were to live in a thorough post-truth society, right, what the consequences of that would be, whether that would even be possible. I mean, I guess there are some people, some people who live in post-truth minds, <laughs> uh, uh, um, or, but even those people largely believe the truth, right? They don't get run over by cars. They just believe that there's this pedophile ring in the pizza parlor. Um, uh, but there's very, still very isolated falsehoods. Crazy stuff, right? But, but, but there's no, it's very rare that people have lost all connection to reality, right? That would, that, that would be perfectly you know, dysfunctional. And, and maybe, maybe it would be for society like that. The question is how large are these pockets of insanity that we can deal with Right? And if we let them grow out of proportion, maybe it becomes a problem, or likely it will, but it's, it's hard to even imagine, to, like, imagine what that vision of a post-truth um, society, society would even look like. But largely, I think the post-truth stuff is not the causally driving force. It's usually something else, and then the post-truth stuff that comes in, comes in uh, later on the basis of different mechanisms. All right, that's it for now. Thank you, Hannes Hauer, for this wonderful lecture.